If everybody could take their seats. Thank you, everybody, for uh, being today for this uh, second uh, joint hearing of the Veterans Affairs Committee and the House Armed Services Committee. I welcome uh, the chairman, Buck McKeon, as well as the ranking member of the HASC, Adam Smith, and, of course, my good friend uh, from Maine, the ranking member of the full VA committee, Mike Michaud. And as I said, this is the second time now uh, that we have gotten these two committees together, and I'm proud to uh, serve on both uh, of these particular committees. And uh, we are going to jointly review the collaborative efforts uh, of the DOD and VA as it uh, pertains to service members with their transition to active duty uh, to civilian life. Uh, a year ago, we were privileged to have both Secretaries Panetta uh, and Shinseki at the witness table, and both of them testified at great length regarding the progress VA, VA and DOD were making in several key areas. And what I'd like to do uh, this morning first is to revisit uh, those areas in my opening statement. First, the progress made in developing an integrated electronic health record. Uh, secondly, the progress that's been made in reducing the wait times associated with VA disability claims, which necessarily does involve cooperation uh, from DOD and the transfer of records. So let's start, if we can, with the uh, electronic uh, health record. Uh, and in a response to a direct question last year, Secretary Shinseki remarked that the two departments had finally, after 17 months of discussion, agreed on a way forward on a single, joint, common integrated electronic health record that would be completed by 2017. The Secretary told us that each of those words, single, joint, and common, meant something, and that finally we were breaking through the cultural issues that had been between the two departments and had been really stifled uh, in the past. And we come here today and I say, what a difference uh, a year makes. Contrary to the Secretary's testimony that the two departments are once again moving on their own tracks, with promises we've heard before about making the two separate systems interoperable. Pardon my frustration, folks, but it seems the only thing interoperable we get are the litany of excuses flying across both departments every year as to why it has taken so long to get this done. In response to this latest course correction, the House included an amendment in the National Defense Authorization and Bill, an amendment that was developed in collaboration with the leadership of HASC and VA and the appropriators uh, to direct the completion of an integrated health record by October 1st of 2016. The message of the amendment is simple. No more excuses. Get it done. I'm anxious to hear from the witnesses today to hear how they'll comply with the mandate of the amendment once it is acted into law. And the second issue I'll briefly touch on is on the disability claims backlog. It's interesting to note that the progress made in reducing the pending inventory of claims the last few months correlates with a heightened congressional oversight and media scrutiny. None of us up here are gonna take our foot off the gas when it comes to ensuring progress is made on the backlog. Every member in this room will agree with that statement. And although progress has been made lately, VA is woefully short of its own goals for this year. So going forward, ending the backlog necessarily requires a seamless record transfer from DOD. I look forward to hearing the status of the efforts on, and what more can be done. The problem of veterans waiting years for their disability claims to be decided must remain at the forefront of our conscience, especially as further troop drawdowns occur over the next five years. It, too, is an example where the excuses have to end and real, sustained progress must occur. To accommodate such a large contingent of members that are with us this morning, I've agreed to last year's framework that limited to two minutes of each member's time to ask a question of the witnesses. And I ask unanimous consent that each member not have not more than two minutes to question the panel of witnesses, starting with my very own question. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent to include all members' uh, statements in the hearing record today, without objection so ordered. 
And I recognize the full committee chairman of the Armed Services Committee, Buck McKeon, for his opening remarks, followed by the ranking member, Mike Michaud, and then the ranking member, Adam Smith, for their opening remarks. Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I join Chairman Miller in welcoming everyone here today to the second special joint hearing with the Veterans Affairs Committee to continue our oversight on the Department of Defense and Department of Veterans Affairs collaboration to assist these members transition to civilian life. After successful, the successful joint hearing held last year, I want to thank Chairman Miller and Ranking Member Mashad for their leadership in continuing the shared efforts to provide our service members and veterans and their families the assistance they need transitioning out of the military and the benefits they deserve for having served this nation. At a time when we're rapidly drawing down our military, which I strongly oppose, Particularly while we are still actively engaged in Afghanistan, the latest announcement of the Army's plan to restructure the Army below 9-11 force levels is another reminder of the impending military drawdown that will force an additional 100,000 service members and their families on an already overburdened veterans benefits system. Today's hearing will look at the Department of Veterans Affairs system for delivering benefits to veterans and the role of the Department of Defense specifically providing information and documents necessary for adjudicating a claim for benefits. It's no secret that the VA has a backlog of well over 500,000 claims from veterans. A significant portion of these claims are more than 125 days old, with some as old as two years. These claims are not only from recently transitioned veterans, but are from Vietnam veterans and veterans of the wars since then. It's easy to talk about a claim as if it's an impersonal object, but behind each of these claims is a veteran. You know, each of us, as we go home and, and talk to our constituents, have people come up to us and tell us horror stories of things that have happened to them. And we all, nobody in this room would wants to see that happen. It's just, it's just a very difficult situation to to resolve all of these issues with we're talking so many people. A veteran who willingly served this country and now is asking only what was promised for that service. Alongside many of these veterans are their families, families who stood by these veterans while they served, enduring the hardships of military life. These are the people behind these claims who are waiting for their benefits. We owe them an answer and we owe them our commitment to continue to ask the hard questions until we're satisfied with the accuracy and the timeliness of the benefits system. We find ourselves in a situation where it's tempting to place blame and look for easy fixes, but that's not our purpose here today. I want to understand the reasons for the backlog, and I want to know what is being done by both departments to complete these backlog claims and expeditiously provide veter veterans with their benefits. Lastly, I want to know from the witnesses how the integrated electronic health record will assist each department fulfill its responsibility for timely delivery of transition assistance and benefits, and what role, if any, the IEHR will play in reducing the VA backlog of claims. Furthermore, I understand that DOD already passes a significant amount of medical information to the VA, and it will be useful for all of us to better know how the IEHR will improve that sharing of information. I've been encouraged by the attention being paid the issue of electronic health records by Secretary Hagel since he took office. The DOD acquisition decision memorandum issued on the June 21st certainly conveys the sense of urgency we hope to instill with the amendment to the fiscal year 14 NDAA that I sponsored with the ranking member, Mr. Smith, and in collaboration with Chairman Miller, Chairman Rogers, Chairman Young, and Chairman Culberson. Both press for aggressive deadlines for implementation and increased oversight to ensure that DOD finally is able to field a seamless integrated electronic health record. What I hope today is to see similar commitment from the VA department and similar mechanisms to address the lack of measurable goals and accountability by VA that the GAO has pointed out in its previous investigations into the issue. It's incumbent on this body to make sure that the leadership for both departments see this as an important matter deserving their personal attention and guidance. 
Our veterans deserve nothing less for the sacrifices they have made for this country. And with that, I, I thank you, Chairman Miller, for your leadership and pulling this together and look forward to this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Michaud. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to thank the, t the two chairmen, Ranking Member Smith, for having this joint hearing today. Uh, transition is a critical issue that greatly affects our service members and veterans. This hearing is the second joint hearing our two committees have held concerning transitions. The purpose of this hearing is to reiterate our joint oversight commitment and to ensure that the Department of Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense work together on behalf of the men and women who are sent into harm's way. At last year's uh, joint hearing on this topic, the two agency secretaries appeared before us, sitting side by side. I'm disappointing to see that neither is here today. I take this as a lack of personal engagement, as a sign that they care less, that they are not as committed as they have been. Uh, and the, my big disappointment is uh, solidified by receiving testimony in the 11th hour. Uh, clearly, this issue is in this hearing is not a priority. Uh, I would uh, submit to you that the government has struggled to fulfill uh, the sacrificed, uh, you know, trust uh, to care for those who have served and sacrificed in defense of our nation. After 12 years of war, we know transition is the critical first step, and it is uh, requires the cooperation of many agencies to accomplish successful. I do not believe that we've made a measurable progress in getting the two agencies before us today to work more effectively together. The Department of Defense has announced it will put out a bid for a new system to manage its health records. Such a decision appears to back an interoperable approach over an integrated one. An integrated is, integ is uh, integrated, not inoperable. Electronic health records is something that Congress has mandated years ago. It was spent hundreds of millions of dollars delaying the delivery of an integrated information sharing system, which runs directly against congressional intent and ultimately hurts our veterans. Also of particular importance uh, to our committees is the claims backlog. Uh, let me be clear, both the VA and the DOD have a responsibility to end the backlog by 2015. The claims backlog is not a VA issue alone. The Department of Defense must do, do a better job in transferring uh, information needed for the VA to approve or disapprove in a timely in manner of the claims. This includes records of our National Guards and reservists. It also includes late and loose records being sent to the VA. Because benefits and health care affect so many service members and veterans, DOD and VA must put aside their parochial differences and work more effectively together to ensure an integrated uh, process addressing uh, transition issues. Over the course of the last several months, we sent letters to the secretaries and the president asking for their personal commitment and support. We requested concrete decisions being made in a timely manner. We, what we received as a response is a no-show to this hearing uh, from the secretaries and the, the press conference that kicks the decision down the road once again. And it would appear that leadership is lacking, not just at this hearing. During the recent roundtable on the IEHR, industry leaders told us progress is not due to lack of availability, available technology solutions, but rather a lack of leadership. That's right. Several of the roundtable participants said there's a lack of leadership. When two divisions in their companies can't or won't agree, the CEO steps in and mandates a direction. Where is the DOD and the VA CEOs? Just recently, in a bipartisan effort and due to ongoing congressional concerns with a backlog, uh, with uh, a lack of unified vision between the VA and DOD, electronic health record programs, language was included in part of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2014. This language creates a deliberate approach in developing a joint electronic health records. I am told that uh, strategies have been modified and collaborative efforts are ongoing for both records transfers and IEHR. However, months continues uh, to go by with uh, seemingly no real progress. I look forward 
uh, to hearing from the panelists today just how far you have come and to learn about the path ahead on this transition issue and, uh, and look forward to your, uh, those questions that we're going to be asking because this is a real important issue that we have to deal with and unfortunately there has been a lack of leadership and I don't only say that with our two secretaries, also the President of the United States who made it very clear uh, in this first term, he wants uh, both agencies to work together, and that leadership has been lacking as well in this particular issue. So I look forward to hearing your comments and to answering the committee's question. For that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think my three colleagues have correctly raised the three issues that we're most interested in today. Um, how do we get joint electronic medical records between the DOD and the VA? Uh, the transfer issue uh, when a veteran goes from being part of active duty DOD over to the VA. Um, how do the benefits transfer? How seamless is that process? There are challenges there. And then, of course, uh, the backlog of claims um, that we are trying to meet. And I share my colleagues' frustration uh, with wanting to get answers to that and wanting to make progress on all three of those issues. Um, but I'm also mindful of a couple of other facts. Over the course of the last almost 12 years now, there have been, there's been a huge increase uh, in the number of injured veterans who have come through, uh, the DOD has had to process and the VA has had to process uh, the initial determination of whether or not uh, a given service member can stay within the DOD or transfer is not an easy process. It's a difficult one for the service member um, as well as their family in making that determination. Um, so that is a significant challenge. The sheer numbers are a significant challenge. Um, and I would also like to point out um, that we have had, I've lost track now over the course of the last two plus years, four, five, six threatened government shutdowns, uh, which force both the DOD and the VA into a position where they don't know how much money they're going to have in a matter of weeks. Uh, so there are things that Congress could do that would be helpful to you as well. Sequestration certainly doesn't help. I know there are aspects of what you do that are exempt from that. There are other aspects that are not exempt from that, and you have to absorb those cuts while trying to deal with that increased number of veterans and while trying to deal um, with the backlog. Uh, and then lastly, um, we have failed to pass appropriations bills in anything approaching a timely manner, uh, and in some cases simply outright failed to pass them uh, so that the VA and DOD for extended period of times are operating with a continuing resolution uh, which again places them at a huge financial disadvantage. So I definitely want to see more leadership out of the VA and out of the DOD, uh, but I think Congress should also take a look in the mirror and pass appropriations bills and fund what we claim to be our top priority. Um, if we really want to get these systems integrated, if we really want to get the backlog cleaned up, then we need to start passing appropriations bills. We need to kill sequestration right now uh, and actually fund what it is that we claim is such a huge priority for us. Uh, so I hope all parties involved will work together uh, to achieve what is clearly our common goal, and that is that our service members who have put their lives on the line to protect our country and at our request, um, at our order as policymakers, uh, are taken care of. Um, that they are not part of a backlog, they do not slip through any crack in the system, they get the treatment and care that they deserve. Uh, but this is a collective responsibility between Congress and the executive branch to get that done. I hope today we'll learn more about how we can work together to make that happen. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, welcome our first panel and only panel uh, to the hearing this morning. Uh, first of all, the Honorable Frank Kendall, uh, Undersecretary for Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics at the Department of Defense. The Undersecretary is accompanied by the Honorable Jonathan Woodson, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs and Director, TRICARE Management Activity at the Department of Defense. And the Honorable Jessica L. Wright, Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness at the Department of Defense. And also with us this morning is Mr. Stephan Warren, Acting Assistant Secretary for Information and Technology at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And Mr. Warren is accompanied by the Honorable Dr. Robert Petzl, Undersecretary for Health with the Department of Veterans Affairs, and Mr. Danny Pumill, the Deputy Undersecretary for Benefits with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I would say to, uh, to Danny, uh, congratulations uh, on your new position. Uh, we look forward to working with you uh, in the future. 
With that, uh, Under Secretary Kendall, you are now recognized for between five and ten minutes. If you can hold it to five, that would be appreciated. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll do my best. Uh, Chairman Miller, Chairman McKeon, Ranking Member Smith and Michaud, members of the committees, uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Department's efforts to improve and modernize our existing electronic health care records and our legacy health care management systems. I'm joined by uh, Acting Assist Undersecretary Wright and Assistant Secretary Woodson. And we were recently informed that we'd be doing just one opening statement, so I will only cover the uh, information technology part of our testimony. Uh, if there are questions, obviously, the, the people of the company would be happy to answer them in terms of the backlog and other elements of health care. Uh, I'd also like to ask, Mr. Chairman, that our written statement be admitted to the record. Without objection, all statements will be entered in the record. My personal involvement in our health care uh, management programs is relatively recent. In April, I was tasked by Secretary Hagel to conduct a review of the Department's legacy health care management system modernization options. The options under consideration were upgrades to DOD's legacy ALTA system, an evolved and enhanced version of VA's legacy VISTA system, or conducting a competition that would include modern commercially available health care management systems, as well as potentially systems based on existing systems like VISTA. With Acting Secretary Wright, I formed a team of senior DOD stakeholders and a working group of experts to evaluate DOD's options and formulate a recommendation. The team worked for approximately a month, but benefited greatly from prior analyses, including a recent study uh, that the department's cost assessment, cost assessment and program evaluation director had conducted, as well as from consultations with VA on the basis of their decision uh, to adopt VISTA as their future healthcare management system core. Cape's analysis was based on extensive market research. The conclusion the working group reached, which was endorsed by the senior stakeholders and then forwarded to the secretary, was that a competition to select the core set of capabilities out of a best value basis was the right business decision for the Department of Defense. I've made the results of that review available to the committee staffs, and I'd be happy to answer your questions on the review or to brief any of the members on the details. Secretary Hagel made a decision to adopt the study recommendations. After VA's decisions a few decision a few months ago to stay with VISTA as the basis of its future healthcare management system core software, DOD had a very different decision to make than VA did. VA has a large installed VISTA base, a large in-house staff that maintains and programs software for VISTA, and a workforce that is experienced and trained with the current vision of the VISTA, of the VISTA system. There are sound logical business reasons for VA's decision regarding VISTA but DOD is not in the same position. The marketplace that provides healthcare management systems has changed significantly in the last few years as we have been going through the process that was alluded to in earlier testimony. That marketplace provides a range of products, modern products, uh, that have advanced significantly over the period of time that I mentioned. This is a vibrant market, and we would like to have the opportunity to select a product that includes uh, some of the offerings from that market. Our market research also showed that we would likely see VISTA-based offerings for multiple competitors. The review Mrs. Wright and I conducted compared cost, risk, performance, and growth potential, and concluded that a sole source selection of either VISTA or DOD's ALTA system was not the best business decision for DOD. A logical and sound business decision for the department would be to conduct a competitive source selection on a best value basis. Let me assure you that nothing in this decision affects DOD's commitment to the joint near-term fielding of fully seamless integrated health records under the IEHR program being conducted by and managed by the Interagency Program Office today. Healthcare records and healthcare management systems are not the same thing. DOD and VA can share integrated records without having the same software to manage those records or to assist clinicians as they provide care. Secretary of Defense has also asked me to take a more direct role in the management of our health records and our health care management systems. We will continue to work closely with VA on all of these efforts. At this point, I'm still in the process of reviewing and assessing the current programs for IHR. But the DOD's commitment to fielding data management accelerators with VA this fiscal year and next year is firm. Uh, Chairman McKeon, you mentioned my acquisition decision memorandum. That was one of the first steps that I took once the Secretary asked me to uh, to take responsibility. In addition, I've appointed some key leaders. Uh, Mr. David Bowen is behind me, uh, as well as a program manager for our modernization system, who will be, who will be I hope, uh, executing some of the leadership that was mentioned earlier. 
compatibility with ongoing joint effort to provide seamless integrated electronic health care records between DOD and VA will be a firm requirement as DOD works to select a core for its health care management software system. I am concerned that language in the House FY14 NDAA and in the House FY14 MILCON and Veterans Appropriation Act may overly restrict both VA's and DOD's options going forward, as well as impose significant oversight burdens on the program. I understand the members' frustrations. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned that with IHR, and I've reviewed the history of the last few years. But we would like to work with the Congress on less restrictive language that would both address your concerns and allow for efficient program execution. I commit to you that DOD will keep the committees informed of our progress and of any major developments in our healthcare record and healthcare management acquisition programs. And the DOD will work closely with VA to ensure that our shared goals of a seamless integrated record in the near term and modernization of our healthcare management systems in the midterm are accomplished efficiently and effectively. Our shared mission with VA is to fundamentally and positively impact the health outcomes of active duty military, veterans, and beneficiaries. Everyone on the panel before you, with one exception, is a veteran. We understand the needs of these people and we support them. Healthcare record and management systems modernization is a part of that process, and we believe the course we have chosen, chosen is a prudent, cost-effective path to achieving our mission. I'll be happy to take your questions. I would like to make one comment on sequestration. It was brought up by in two of the opening remarks. I, I cannot sit before this committee today, two days after we started furloughing our employees, and not mention sequestration. The effects of sequestration are real. They're distributed all across the department. They are not dramatic in any specific instance, but their cumulative impact is dramatic. And they're they are having, a, and they will have it over time, particularly if allowed to continue in FY14, a devastating impact on the department. I know I'm not here to testify about that, but I can't pass up the opportunity to mention it. Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll conclude. Mr. Warren. Chairman Miller, Chairman McKeon, Ranking Member Smith, Ranking Member Michelle, and members of the committees. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the collaboration taking place between the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense. I'm accompanied today on my far left by Undersecretary Robert Petzl for Health, and to my immediate left, uh, Mr. Danny Pummel, the Principal Deputy Undersecretary for Benefits. The efforts of our two departments reflect an unprecedented level of collaboration on a number of important goals to ensure seamless transition from service member to veteran. Through DOD and VA channels, such as the Joint Executive Committee, the Health Executive Committee, the Benefits Executive Committee, independent working groups, and the day-to-day -day work of our respective hardworking employees, our two departments are removing barriers and challenges which impede seamless transition. Our collaboration efforts with DOD are also helping VA meet its goals of increasing access to care, ending the benefits claims backlog, and ending veterans' homelessness. We are making progress together in several key areas. Thanks to the Vow to Hire Heroes Act, we now enroll every new service member in e-benefits. Enrollment has grown to 2.6 million since June 2011, an increase of over 648%. We now have in place that single portal, whether you're a service member or veteran, you can come to find out not only what your benefits are, but also what the status of your claims are. Through e-benefits, the two departments provide veterans and service members a central location to research, find, access, and manage a growing list of benefits. DOD and VA fully implemented the Integrated Disability Evaluation System, known as IDES, in October 2011. IDES is an integrated DOD-VA program for service members being evaluated for medical separation from military service that leads to faster processing time, increased transparency for the service member, and a single set of medical exams for single source disability ratings and much more. In April of 2009, President Obama directed the DOD and VA to work together to define and build a seamless system of integration for electronic health records. Today, DOD and VA are already exchanging a significant amount of electronic information and are taking aggressive action in 2013 to further expand these efforts. But most of the information today is not standardized. A key priority for both departments is to standardize electronic health record data and to make it immediately available for clinicians so that they have the information they need to make informed clinical decisions for our patients. A critical mission of both departments is to fundamentally and positive, positively impact the health outcomes of active duty military, veterans, and eligible beneficiaries. 
As a result, we have two distinct goals. Create a seamless health record integrating VA, DOD, and private provider data, and to modernize the software supporting DOD and VA clinicians. We are committing to doing both of these in the most efficient and effective way possible. VA is still on track with your support to deploy our core capability at two sites by 1 October 2014 and full operational capability by the end of 2017. We are also working closely with our DOD colleagues to address the benefits claims backlog. Today, many veterans wait too long to receive benefits they have earned and deserved. This has never been acceptable to the Secretary or the dedicated employees of the Veterans Benefit Administration, over half of which are veterans themselves. VA is implementing a robust plan to ensure we achieve our goal of eliminating the claims backlog and improving decision accuracy to 98% 2015. We are making progress in reducing the processing times for disability claims, and we are on track to meet our agency priority goal of eliminating the backlog of claims, those pending longer than 125 days in 2015. The total inventory of claims is now below 800,000, the lowest since April 2011, and the backlog has been reduced by more than 14% from its highest point just four months ago. For the second month in a row, VA claims processors set production records by completing more claims than in any previous monthly period. Collaboration efforts are ongoing with DOD to allow VA to receive complete service records and to receive them electronically for faster and more efficient processing. On December 6, 2012, VBA reached an agreement with our partners in DOD requiring the military services to certify a service member's service treatment record as complete as possible at the point of transition to VA. Effective January 1, 2013, all five military services began implementation of service treatment record certification. By the end of this year, each of the military services will be sending all of the service treatment records electronically to VA. This will contribute to reducing the time it takes to process future disability claims. VA and DOD are committed to our collaborations, and we continue to look for ways to improve our decision making, achieve greater efficiencies, and accelerate the transition process for service members and veterans. Thank you again for your support for our service members, veterans, and their families, and your interest in the ongoing collaboration and cooperation between the two departments. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today, and we are prepared answer any questions you may have. Mr. Kendall, first first question is in regards to the bidding process or the, the request for proposals that the DOD has done. Do you anticipate VISTA being one of the softwares that will be allowed to be reviewed in the process? Uh, the answer is yes. Our market research uh, uh, that was conducted by CAPE, as I mentioned, had a number of responses. 50, 15 of those responses were, were fully compliant with the request. And of those 15, three were VISTA-based solutions. So we know there are vendors out there. Now, one of the uh, uh, submissions was from the VA itself, and the other two were from commercial integrators. So we, we would have fully expect that VISTA uh, will be included in the things that we have to choose from. Uh, also, it won't be today's VISTA. It'll be a VISTA that is, is improved over the, over the course of the time between now and when we'd actually make the award. So we'll have an, uh, an enhanced version of VISTA, if you will, at the time we do the source selection. Mr. Warren, I will say that in, in reviewing your testimony, talking about the backlog, you talked about several reasons that there's a backlog in there. Um, the the undersecretary has talked about the surge of personnel that's been used to reduce the backlog. Nowhere do I see anything about anything that VA has done wrong, i.e. mismanagement of personnel. And my fear is that we're going to end up right back in the same place eventually. We may draw the numbers down, but if we don't change the system and how it's done, uh, we're going to continue to see the backlog. I mean, you know, the, the Nemers decision and all of that, I mean, that was, we knew that was coming. The secretary knew it was coming. He actually said that by 2013, now, we would be right back where we were prior to Nemers. We're way above where we are. So, I mean, does, does VA have any culpability of, in regards to the backlog, or is it just things outside their control? Mr. Chairman, if I could hand that to my colleague uh, from the Benefits Administration to respond. Uh, Chairman Miller, um, 
one of the things that we that we have done is the the VBMS, the Veterans uh, Benefits Management System. Um, we were in a paper system when we started doing the NEMR cases and worked through the NEMR cases and got the additional workload from the current conflict. We now have a fully automated system rolled out to all 56 of our ROs. And by, by fully automated, I mean that it's in position at the ROs and we're starting to do cl claims electronically instead of paper. Uh, today, about 20% of the total workload that we have is, is, is electronic. 80% is still paper. Our goal is to, you know, not only knock out the backlog, but to get all of that into electronic format. That'll put us in a position so that if a, uh, a claim comes in from uh, Ohio, it doesn't have to be done uh, in, in the state of Ohio by a claims person in Ohio. When the claim comes in, the next available claim person anywhere in the country can take that claim and work it because all of the records will be electronic, eliminating the need to mail records around the country and things like that. Um, we believe with the uh, uh, advent of the Veterans Benefits Management System and the electronic service treatment records that we're going to be receiving from the Department of Defense this year, that that will go a long way to preventing future backlogs and ending this backlog right now. Mr. McKeon. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, Secretary Kendall, Secretary Warren, the process for gathering the necessary information to complete a veteran's claim for benefits requires participation by the veteran, the DOD, and the VA. Some of the information is provided directly to the VA by the service member. Other information is sent from DOD to the VA, either in electronic format or hard copy paper documents. I'm particularly interested in the healthcare and medical information or records that the DOD sends to the VA. What medical information records are provided by the DOD to the VA and when and in what format are they sent, number one? And two, who receives the information at the VA and how is the information then linked to a veteran's claim for benefits? Uh, Mr. Chairman, information is generally sent electronically in digital form and we've been doing that for quite a few years now. We send about over a million elements of data per day to the VA electronically. Um, the problem with those records is, A, that they're incomplete. There are some paper files, often paper that's produced by commercial providers of health care that our servicemen have seen that need to be sent as well. Uh, uh, there are also problems at VA with how uh, accessible and readable some of that information is and how much it can be manipulated. But we are sending electronic records, and we have been doing that for quite some time, and that's the way bulk of the information goes. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Wright and Dr. Woodson to, to give you a more full answer. Sure, if I can add to Mr. Ken Mr. Kendall's statement, um, we have an agreement now with the VA that I think is working very well, and that is to provide the service treatment records, which includes personnel data, it includes administrative data, it includes medical data and dental. We also certify that at uh, hubs within our services within 45 days of the service member departing um, the military system and moving into the veteran system. We send that electronically and we send it um, paper-wise to the repository in VA. By the 31st of December, we will be sending everything electronically to VA, which will increase the speed of processing a claim should that individual choose to file a disability claim. Um, my time has expired. I, I don't know if there's time for Mr. Woodson, would you like to add anything? I would. Thank you very much uh, for the question and the invitation to be here today. Um, as Secretary Kendall indicated, uh, we send um, a lot of health record information electronically now. Um, and uh, for anyone who might be interested, uh, I will give you a website or a CD that shows the functionality of the type of data we send that can be used in direct patient care as well as claims adjudication is rather significant and it, it really has more information and functionality than I would say uh, most uh, private offices uh, in the private sector and many integrated hospital systems in the private sector. By the end of the year, 
not only will we be able to exchange that information so that it is read, uh, it can be read by um, whomever might need the information in the Veterans Administration System, but it will be computable data. Uh, through the ongoing projects we have uh, through the uh, interagency program office uh, focusing on this accelerator for this data interoperability, which is really an important feature. It will be computable data that will be real time uh, that allows um, uh, uh, providers as well as administrators uh, to use that information for the benefit of the transitioning service member. And so I, I think um, I'd be happy to make myself available to any uh, member uh, or staff member to walk them through what the capabilities are. I think if you have a chance to look at it, you would be uh, surprised at how much capability is there. One last comment is that in, in trying to assist the uh, Veterans Administration um, in claims adjudication, particularly interfacing with uh, the VBA, um, we have a project, um, um, it's called the Health Artifacts Information System which uh, will take care of uh, electronically transferring all of that loose and late uh, paper that so ties up uh, the adjudication of these claims. So we'll be able to capture all of that information that is coming from the private sector on care that was delivered to uh, servicemen and women. And remember, uh, from the DOD's point of view, about 60% of care uh, uh, comes uh, from the private sector. But we'll be able to capture that and be able to transfer that electronically and interface with their VBMS system, uh, which is uh, part of their re-engineering. Uh, one more point, perhaps, is that as we've gone through this process, we've also learned that it's about not only the technology, it's not only about the technology solutions, but it's also about the business process reengineering. And I want to uh, thank, actually, uh, our VA colleagues because uh, we've, uh, through information sharing uh, summits and the like, have uh, illuminated uh, areas where the business processing reengineering needs to occur so that they can take advantage of the technology solutions. So thanks very much for the question. Mr. Michaud. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This question, I got two questions. So the first one's for Mr. Warren and Mr. Kendall. Uh, when will the two departments have a full capabilities of a integrated seamless healthcare records that can be used as the president had envisioned? The first question. The second question is for, for Mr. Kendall, and, and I'd like to read uh, to you from the text of a March 28, 2013 memo from the Office of the Secretary of Defense regarding the pursuit of the president's open, open standards for electronic health records, and it reads in part, and I quote, Throughout the first term, the department's actions have been inconsistent with the president's agenda. The department's past and current desire is to completely replace its healthcare information technology package with an existing commercial healthcare management package. End of quote. It goes on to say that, and I quote, the department's resistance to the president's open standard agenda appears to be founded largely on an incorrect assumption, end of quote. My questions uh, to that, those quotes is, do you believe that the president's agenda was worth pursuing or was there some mix up at the Department of Defense? And please you know, help me understand this because this has been going on for four years long before sequester came in. I'd hope that you'd be able to uh, uh, give us uh, some idea. So those are uh, my two questions. in 25 seconds or less. I, I, all of these terms have like integrated record, carry an awful lot of weight and are interpreted differently by different people. My view is that by 2014, we will have integrated records that we share with VA. That's what the near-term projects are doing. It's what the accelerators, what Dr. Woodson mentioned, are doing. And it's important for the committees to distinguish between integrated records and healthcare management software. The healthcare management software doesn't just make a record. It helps the physicians do their job. And that's a very important reason for us to modernize our systems. But as far as the records are concerned, we will have records to common standards, and they will be movable seamlessly between DOD and VA for use by both benefits uh, uh, adjudication purposes and for healthcare purposes. Uh, your second question is about the, um, the, the comments you made about the president's agenda. We are fully supportive of the president's agenda. So is VA. We're united in our effort to develop common standards 
and to support the national standards that the president articulated as a goal and that we're working on with HHS. So I, I don't know what the source of that quote was, but I think it is entirely incorrect. Uh, Actually, the, the, the quote was from the Department uh, of Defense, the Secretary's office. That's not, and I'll give you the memo from DOD, but uh, they made it very clear it's inconsistent it, with what the president it, uh, directed it, it, them to do. I understand, but it is not correct. Mr. Smith. That's following up on the computer records a little bit. Is it? Is it the case that you're going, and I think you've mentioned this, but I just want to clarify, is it the case that you're going to have to develop a brand new system that both departments can use, or do you think that there is a software fix that can get your two systems to begin to better talk to each other? We are currently talking to each other. I think there's a misconception about this. Yeah. We are sending electronic records today. So in that sense, we are talking to each other. VA can read DOD's records and we send them. Okay, we want to have an improved system from that. We're not just reading the records, but actually using them and using the data that's provided. We also want to eliminate paper that's currently part of the records that we're sending uh, for the reasons that I mentioned that were discussed earlier. So we're moving very quickly to accomplish those two things. That's a separate thing from the software that manages uh, healthcare provision. And that's, right. and that's the distinction that I want to make. This and in the software management, system, you are saying that you're going to come up with a new, relatively new system beyond what we, you have. Our, right our choices are not between, we, we were on the path at one time to develop an entirely new system. Right. That was the history of this. That's a tough path. It is a tough path. And yeah. we, we decided to get off of it. Yes. Uh, the cost for that were going to be exorbitant. The, the last estimate that I saw was $28 billion of life cycle cost. So the decision was made a few months ago to get off of that path. Now, once we were off that path, VA made a decision that the best path for VA was to continue with VISTA and evolve and enhance VISTA into a modern project, modern, a more modern product. For DOD, as I mentioned in my opening comments, we have a little different situation. We have a very different situation. So we're not going to develop a new system. We're going to look at a range of options that will include commercial, mature products that are modern products that are being used throughout the healthcare yeah, industry. Because that, that's where the software improvement comes. I work with a ton of companies, and I think gosh, going back 20 years, we've had this history in a variety of different, you know, government agencies where they try to come up with some brand new system where what has evolved is software solutions to get old systems to better communicate with each other. And that is, is the, seems like the better approach. Uh, for, for DOD, it is better to have a choice among a range of options that right. includes those types of systems. VA, as I said, is in a different position and I'm not, they have Vista, and they have in-house programmers to work with Vista, et cetera. So they have an established base they can build on. It's not where we are. Um, there's an analogy uh, that you'll probably be familiar with from your Armed Services Committee activities with radios, tactical radios that DOD acquires, where we were doing a program of records that took years and years and years. Right. And meanwhile, the commercial industry was moving forward very quickly. Yes. And we, made a, we came to a conclusion to cancel some of those programs and go out and do com commercial light competitions yeah. in lieu of doing our own development. So yeah. we're a little right. bit in that situation here. The, the, the tyranny of the program of record is a phrase that occurs to me many times when I look at some of our acquisition challenges. And I know you've done a lot of work to try to, try to get around that. I yield back. Thanks. Mr. Runyon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know we've been talking here a lot about moving forward. Um, I sit on both of these committees, both Haskin Arms, Haskin VA, and I chaired a subcommittee that deals with disability assistance and memorial affairs. My question is really directed both at the VA and the DOD, and this comes from a past VA hearing. Um, in the hearing, it was discovered that VA initially, when VA initially requests records from the DOD, and we're talking about paper records, we're talking about dealing with the current backlog. VA will wait 60 days before sending a follow-up request. Following that request, VA will wait an, an additional 30 days to respond for DOD to respond before making another contact to DOD. Now, this is a very large work window, and as VA is trying to adjudicate these claims in 125 days or less, that leaves 35 days before the, they can actually get their hands on the paperwork. It was discovered through uh, through the hearing that this rule was probably self-promulgated from the VA's um, adjudication manual. Is this window necessarily that large? Does the VA need to change their protocols on that? And why does it take the DOD so long to get the requested materials? I could hand that to Mr. Hummel to answer, sir. Uh, 
uh, Congressman, it's the, the, the time frames that you quoted are, are, are accurate time frames. And those time frames are based on uh, the requirement that we have in the Veterans Benefits Administration to assist veterans, a duty to assist, that says that if we get a record and we believe that the record is not a complete record, that we have certain time frames that we have to re-request re, re the record again. Now, we've actually fixed that in some work that we've done with Ms. Wright's office in that the Department of Defense has already started as of January this year working to give us from the five services certified service treatment records. Basically what they do now is they give us a service treatment record with a document on top saying that Department of Defense certifies that this is a full and complete record. That means that the record has all of the, uh, we have their personnel information, their dental information, their medical information, and not just treatment from a military treatment facility, but maybe if they went outside for TRICARE or something, that eliminates the need for the VA to go out and ask for any additional information. No more 60-day letter, no more 30-day letter. This will improve again when we get to December of this year and we start receiving all of that information electronically because we'll be able to ship it around to different places to adjudicate it. But yes, that was a problem. That still is a problem with veterans that are um, from previous conflicts that are not coming directly from the Department of Defense because we still have to go out and request any place they may have been for all their records to ensure that we have everything possible to give that veteran every benefit of the doubt when we're adjudicating their claim. Thank you. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Ticano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased that DOD and VA along with several other agencies have collaborated to improve and reinvent the transition assistance program. However, I heard from the California Department of Veterans Affairs that they are being excluded from participation in Transition GPS, the new program. State governments provide key resources and services for veterans, and I think it is important that they are included in the transition program. Can any of you address why the California Veterans Affairs Department is being excluded, or if that is a mistake, uh, what will you do to address the issue? Sir, I'd like to address that issue, please. Um, any individual that spends 180 days on um, active duty is goes through the transition assistance program that is a, a now a very active program at 206 installations throughout our system. It is a collaborative effort between Department of Defense, between VA and between uh, Department of uh, Labor. The transition GPS will be up and running um, in uh, the 1st of October of 2013. In fact, we just all had a meeting about that yesterday. But there are tracks to that that those individuals that come through the transition program still do. They do MOS comparison to civilian, they do a transition plan, they do a financial plan, and they do a career readiness solution. Um, what will be added on the transition GPS are three additional tracks that could potentially, that are volunteer. The individual does not have to go through. So my concern is, I don't know if you're talking about a reservist or guardsman who is leaving the guard and reserve system, or if you're talking about somebody who is leaving the active duty system. So what I've explained is for somebody that has been on active duty, I would like to make an appointment with you and follow up to see if it's clearly on the reserve and guard side, and then I can answer your question. I'd appreciate that effort. Thank yes, you. Sir. Mr. Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've heard both um, Chairman Miller and Chairman McKeon mentioned the collaborative effort we have with DOD and VA. Um, one of the concerns that I have is with these furloughs that the Secretary of Defense has ordered. We know that the VA employees are exempt from that, but not DOD employees. And so my concern is what impact is that going to have on the transfer of this uh, information over from DOD? Um, and if we have a 20 percent loss in the time uh, that um, these employees have, are we concerned about the messaging that we're sending to our service members that after a decade of war that they have served their country, that the country is somehow content to give them 80% effort in this transitioning? 
sir, if I may, thank you for the question. Um, I'd like to piggyback on to what Mr. Kendall said. Uh, sequestration is real in our department. I understand and, sequestration is and, real. And Some of us didn't support it, but the decision on the furloughs was the secretary's. Absolutely, sir. And furloughs are real, and they are catastrophic to the department, and they're catastrophic to the great civilian employees that work for the department. Saying that, we realize how important this is for those individuals that have served our country admirably in the military to transfer their records to VA in whole, in a whole certified manner as Mr. Pummel brought up, the agreement that we have between the two departments. We are making that 45-day window. The reason we have a 45-day window is to collect all that loose flowing information from TRICARE and other agencies where we can then certify that they're correct and send them over to VBA uh, to their um, repository. So should the individual choose to file a disability, his, his or her records are there and correct. So yes, furloughs are real. Yes, they're damning. Um, but we have kind of locked this down as hugely important and we're putting a full court press on it, sir. And I've got four seconds. I don't think you've answered the question, but if you could at some point in time, give us some metrics of a plan so that we can measure independently that we're reaching our goals. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Sir, we have the, if I may. Please. We have a metric of 100%. The last report from VA, and we get our numbers from VA, we were at 97% success rate of getting our records to VA on time. We collaborate every day on this. I can provide you more metrics if Thank you choose. You. I'd love to. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just, just quickly, since we have little time, how is the how are the VA and the DOD working together on after-action reports regarding suicides? I'm familiar that the different services have their own um, ways of, of doing that, but how are you integrating uh, those discussions, and what have we learned from it? Uh, and secondly, what are we doing to reduce the stigma so that people who are having difficulties actually report those difficulties so that that goes on their, their medical reports when they do apply for benefits later on? I understand that a number of people actually do not, and so when the VA has to rate them down the line, they have no, nothing on which to base it, even though they've been serving for a number of years. Congresswoman Davis, let me um, begin at least to answer that question. The um, VA and DOD have a joint integrated mental health strategy. One element of that strategy is, is suicide. We recently um, jointly developed an integrated uh, record keeping system for suicide where we collect the data from each one of the states as to the rate of suicide, et cetera, amongst veterans, collate that data, and then use it to analyze our experiences in the DOD on one hand and in the VA on the other hand. The second thing is that we have a number of joint efforts going on right now to destigmatize suicide, the Make the Connection campaign and the Stand by Them campaign are two efforts to destigmatize mental health in general, but suicide in particular, and to not glorify suicide. Um, the third element is the military VA crisis hotline where people that are having a difficulty can call. We've received almost 900,000 calls since it began uh, almost four and a half years ago. 26,000 saves from that. That is people who were in danger of harming themselves or someone else that were rescued from, uh, from doing that. The, the, the suicide work group, the mental health work group of our health executive council that VA and DOD jointly chair it regularly reviews the suicide experiences um, within each organization and looks for in further joint efforts. That Excuse me, are those shared with the family as well? Are those reports shared with the family? Um, it, 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 I can speak only for the VA in terms of the family that uh, when we do a uh, what we call a psychological autopsy on a patient or a review, yes, we would uh, do what we call institutional disclosure and discuss that with the family. Okay, thank you. Dr. Beneshek. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, my question actually is for Dr. Petzl. Uh, in 2008, the uh, NDAA, the, a joint DOD VA Vision Center of Excellence, was established at Walter Reed. The purpose of this center, along with 
two other joint centers of excellence was to improve clinical coordination and best practices between the DOD and the VA. The center was also tasked with developing a joint trauma registry containing up-to-date inf info on the diagnosis, treatment, and the follow-up for injuries received by our nation's military. Uh, the Vision Center alone was allocated $6.9 million over five years. Uh, apparently, there's two current staff members from the VA located at the Vision Center of en Excellence. And this is despite repeated promises from the secretary that there would be no less than six. Uh, why hasn't this, uh, more staff been committed to the Vision Center? Uh, thank you, Dr. Benichek. My understanding is that we have committed the uh, staff that was initially agreed to. I will go back, sir, and find out. Exactly I, I've also heard reports is. that uh, the VA plans to pull out of the Centers of Excellence. Is there any truth to that? No, we do not plan on. We fully support the concept of the Centers of Excellence. Well, I'd like to be sure that there's six staff members, as the Secretary promised. I've also heard reports that the VA has been refusing DOD IT personnel with security clearance to access the VA health records for purpose of building the trauma registry. Uh, do you have any knowledge of that? I do not, sir. I would ask uh, Mr. Warren if he has any knowledge of that. I'd like to take that for the record, but I'm not aware of that taking place, sir. Well, let's, let's follow up with uh, your staffs and that so we get these answers because uh, I've got some credible reports that uh, indicate that these questions are valid. And can we reach out to your staff for further information? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. My time is up. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Miller, uh, Chairman McKeon, for your leadership uh, to promote DOD VA uh, collaboration on behalf of our military service members and military families and retirees. Uh, Mr. Pummel, how many of the pending claims of VA is uh, waiting to process require information to be provided from the DOD to be processed? Um, uh, about 4 percent. It's, it's not very much. Well, that, that's impressive. That's good. Yes. Uh, Ms. Wright, how many pending claims does DOD need to provide the VA information? So we're working on the 4% that we are required to provide. We are also providing the current service treatment records of those that are leaving, but those that are within the backlog is about 4%. And this 4% has been a significant reduction, apparently. Is that correct? We're working together, sir. We have a team on the ground, two teams on the ground at VA at their request, and they're working hand in glove with VA to bring down that number. Well, I, I uh, appreciate very much that information, and please keep us informed. Uh, Ms. Pummel, Mr. Pummel, do you believe that a joint DOD-VA integrated electronic health care record would substantially aid the VA in eliminating the current backlog? The, uh, a, a joint electronic health record probably won't do anything for the current backlog. Um, it'd be wonderful for the future to have everybody in the government to be able to look at one medical record and grab all their information. Uh, right now, what we need is the uh, electronic personnel dental and uh, medical records, which we've got a commitment from the Department of Defense to get by the end of this calendar year. And uh, for claims purposes, that, that's, that's what I need. Um, the electronic health record, if, if, if that ever works out for the future, that would be great and that would help in the future, but it would not help us in eliminating the current backlog. And, and finally, for the health and safety, I certainly hope every effort is made to expedite uh, the uh, electronic health care records. It just, it's just got uh, for all of you, it's just so important. Thank you very much for your service. Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, for Undersecretary Kendall, uh, I wanted to draw your attention to a Reuters investigative piece that was published yesterday uh, entitled The Pentagon's Payroll Quagmire Traps America's Soldiers. And uh, one of the soldiers that they focus on is based at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, the community I have the honor of representing, and after returning from two combat tours, uh, suffering from severe PTSD, traumatic brain injury, uh, nerve damage, and chronic pain, uh, his pay is mysteriously garnished, and going from 3300 a month to about $1,000 less uh, without explanation, uh, after he complains about it, uh, his pay goes down to a little over $115 a month forcing he and his family to go to 
uh, food pantries to be able to feed themselves. He has three children uh, having to go through Operation Santa Claus to get Christmas gifts uh, for his children. And the Reuters uh, reporter was able to find that this is not an isolated incident. It is widespread uh, throughout the Department of Defense. There was also a GAO report in 2012 uh, that cited some of these same problems. The response from the Department of Defense was to call the GAO report overblown. Uh, one of the other findings in the article shows that the Department of Defense's uh, system is a jury-rigged network of incompatible computer systems for payroll and accounting. They are obsolete and unable to speak with each other or communicate with each other within the DOD. Um, and so uh, I knew we had a problem communicating DOD to VA. I didn't know that we had a problem communicating DOD to DOD. Uh, considering the GAO report, uh, the Reuters uh, report, um, this case uh, of the uh, of Medic Aiken, uh, what is your response to this? How are you going to fix this, and when will you fix this? Congressman, I'm going to have to pass that question over to Ms. Wright. Apologize for the microphone. Um, first, I will tell you that I have not seen the article, but I will absolutely read it today. It is very important. It is catastrophic if this is happening to our service members, if it's happening to one or if it's happening to a multitude. Um, so I would like to do that. Um, I am the personnel and readiness person, so I'm not responsible for DFAS, but I'm responsible for the health and welfare of our soldiers and our military members. So, sir, I don't have an answer for you. I'd like to take it for the record, but more importantly, I'd like to follow up on the one particular person and fix that right away, see what we have for the system issues, involve the comptroller, and get back to you if that's okay. I look forward to following up with you. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Lobsack. I thank you, Chairman. I want to thank the two chairs and the ranking members for this, this hearing. I had seven uh, veterans forums last week at the beginning of the week, and uh, uh, what uh, Congressman O'Rourke mentioned is something I hear often. Uh, I, I, I just spend all my two minutes sort of recounting all the stories that I've heard uh, over the seven years that I've been in office, so I won't do that. I just want to broaden out the discussion of mental health a little bit, if I may. Good to see you again, Dr. Woodson. I hope you'll chime in on this as well. And uh, Dr. Petzl, it's really important what Congresswoman Davis brought up, the suicide issue, but I'd like to go a little bit further than that, talk about transitioning from DOD to VA, in particular from active duty uh, to the VA, and with respect to the mental health care system that's in existence now with DOD and then going to the VA. Can both of you speak to that issue, please? Yes, I'd be happy to start, uh, and thank you again for uh, uh, this question, which is a really important topic. Uh, as we know, uh, mental health issues have, one of the, have become one of the signature health issues um, out of the uh, decade plus of war. As uh, Dr. Petzl said um, uh, several moments ago, uh, he and I have worked very, very closely together uh, to harmonize and advance the care uh, relative to mental health. It begins with uh, a group that has been working on an integrated mental health strategy so that um, we are uh, uh, enhancing the practice guidelines even as we hand off uh, service members who are transitioning to veteran status. Uh, we have a robust uh, collaborative effort on research to advance our understanding of treatment strategies that are important. Uh, we have a uh, significant collaborative effort uh, to ensure uh, transition is smooth in transition programs, uh, making sure that there is a follow-up at the VA. Um, we have uh, developed um, a, a series of initiatives uh, that uh, are looking at um, uh, what kind of care is being delivered and its effectiveness, and we discuss this every month in terms of how to move this ball forward. Um, the development of applications that can be used by individuals who might have PTSD uh, to um, uh, enhance resolution of uh, uh, their symptoms. Um, what has it been interesting, and this goes to a question that was asked earlier about uh, suicide, is that we've learned something from the studies that have been done in the Department of Defense and in the Department of Veterans Affairs that, in fact, we have slightly different issues uh, relative to the cohorts that we need to focus on and how we need to tailor some of our uh, 
um, suicide prevention programs and campaigns. So within the Department of Defense, um, the uh, biggest profile at risk are the young uh, individual, uh, first time enlisted, uh, who has financial problems, relation problems, maybe previous family problems prior to coming into the service. Uh, whereas in the Veterans Affairs, it's the uh, vet in the 50s or 60s uh, with uh, additional uh, qualifiers. And so it's been very important to understand that bimodal uh, set of events so that we can individually address uh, what might be the factors uh, for uh, the people uh, in our society and the people we're responsible for that are most at risk. But the bottom line message I want to leave you with is that um, uh, Dr. Petzl and I, as uh, the uh, people principally responsible for this, uh, work enormously closely together to uh, try and enhance uh, our understanding, um, treatment strategies, prevention. Uh, and, I, and I would just say that, uh, you know, we're doctors, and so we don't just concentrate on medical issues. We're talking about how to develop comprehensive uh, programs uh, writ large. Uh, to get communities involved, the uh, crisis line, uh, uh, try and educate families about uh, um, risk factors and profile of the people at risk. Uh, so um, we uh, co-sponsor a suicide prevention um, uh, conference to bring our people together to look at uh, uh, what we should be doing and what advances should be made. So um, difficult problem, but uh, uh, we are 110% uh, after this together. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, could I add just 30 seconds to what yes, Dr. Woodson said? Thank you. Um, two things. Number one is that we have a series of case managers that we share that uh, transit the seriously ill and injured people from the DOD into the VA healthcare system, and this includes people with serious mental illness. Um, we are hoping that the transition assistance program, the new TAP, is going to have in it an even better way of making a hot transfer for people that are ill, not necessarily in the seriously ill or injured group, but, but do need that kind of transition. And the last thing I'd comment on, just to reiterate what uh, Dr. Woodson said, I've been in the VA for a long time, I've worked with DOD for a long time. The level of collaboration and cooperation in the clinical sphere in medicine right now is unprecedented. I mean, absolutely, we share so much and do so many things now jointly that we wouldn't have even dreamed of five or six years ago. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging for such a lengthy period. Mr. Coffin, answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Secretary Wright, there uh, um, has been a, a, a three-part series by the Colorado uh, Springs Gazette uh, that an, an investigative uh, report reporting that talked about soldiers receiving less than honorable discharges. Uh, due to minor infractions, and a lot of those soldiers are combat veterans from Iraq and, and uh, uh, from Afghanistan, uh, who uh, also uh, uh, it was reported that had uh, TBI and, and post-traumatic stress disorder in some of those instances. Um, these, the nature of these discharges disallowed these uh, combat veterans from receiving uh, any care under the VA. And so uh, I'm wondering if you, I'm very concerned uh, about this, and I wonder if you can uh, comment on this. Sir, I can, I can comment on the transition portion, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Woodson to comment on the medical diagnosis portion. Or the, so the minor infraction that you talked about could be a multitude of things. These individuals, whether they receive an honorable discharge or whether they receive a less than honorable, would still go through the transition program that, that all service members leaving the program must go through. During that period of time, they receive not only um, counseling from the Department of Defense and Department of Labor, they also receive six hours of counseling classes from the VA. So. Um, what uh, what the Secretary of VA is concerned about is even when people leave with a dishonorable discharge, people going into kind of the homeless category. And so he wants that warm handoff through the VA system and we're working together. Now your question involved those that may have PTSD 
or another type of diagnosis that could have related to the dishonorable discharge. And I'm less, than, uh, less, than honor, there's a di less than honorable discharge versus dishonorable. There's a pretty significant Yes, difference. sir. Less than honorable versus dishonorable. So I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Woodson because we are doing something to review those cases. Uh, again, thank you for the question. And again, uh, just to restate, I think at the heart of your question is whether or not some individuals are being discharged with less than honorable discharge, being denied benefits, and in fact have an injury of war. Um, and so uh, we've enhanced our screening and required screening that if someone is being discharged for um, what is considered uh, um, uh, bad, con dis uh, bad conduct discharge, that they have to go through certain screening uh, for PTSD um, and uh, TBI to ensure that that is not a contributing factor. Um, uh, so, um, you know, heretofore, um, there were examples of individuals because, um, you know, line leadership just was not clinically oriented and someone did a bad thing, but the, the question was, what was the root cause of uh, that change in behavior? Was it a brain injury or was it um, uh, PTSD? Uh, we now have uh, screening mechanisms to uh, look at those issues. So if I can follow up on one more thing. Um, uh, at the beginning of a war, we may have diagnosed them as having an adjustment disorder, which is different than PTSD or right. TBI, of course. So we have rescreened those cases within the services. That doesn't mean we can reverse the discharge because it may not have been, uh, you know, I don't know what the particular issue was that created that particular discharge, but we are working through each an individual case to see if we, if the misdiagnosis was there, which could have resulted in the, um, in the unfavorable discharge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, yield back. I would just like to see treatment available to these, uh, uh, these, uh, soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors who have served this country uh, 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 in combat and, and are being discharged uh, for minor, were discharged for minor infractions. Mr. Conaway. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I was struck by the uh, sincerity of each one of your answers, particularly when you're confronted with uh, what appears to be a failure, like Mr. O'Rourke was uh, mentioning it earlier uh, and wanting to get at it. But I'd like Mr. Kendall, Mr. Warren, to think about the word accountability. Each of you have talked about um, deadlines and progress to be made in the future and those kind of things. Um, if those things aren't met, what is, is, is anybody's performance evaluation uh, affected or the consequences for anybody in the system for failure to meet the deadlines that, uh, that you're being set? Absolutely. One of the things I've asked for the IPO to do, and we'll be doing this together with Mr. Warren, is to lay out a set of commitments list of deliverables with schedules that we, we, we expect them to deliver. So those will be shared commitments between ourselves and DOD and VA, and the IPO will be held responsible. It's similar to what we do with all of our program managers and program executive officers. We're going to be managing this program. So a year from now, we would be able to look at a, a, an evaluation report from somebody who had a standard to be met, didn't meet it. There would be a consequence on their personnel evaluation, and they'd either be fired or demoted or held accountable some way? Yes. Okay, Mr. Warren, how about your side? Uh, the same, sir. Say again? Oh. Yes, the accountability and the responsibility to perform to the standards and the commitments we've made is in the performance plans, and individuals are held accountable for those. Sir. Okay. You just used the word past tense, are, or currently. So we'll, we could look we'll at your are system. And will and, be, sir. Well, but we could look at your system and actually see where somebody was disciplined or uh demoted or fired or something because they didn't meet some important deadline or, or their performance rating was less than uh an outstanding so again remember the the way the performance program works is you lay out how many how many times did you get outstanding uh, i i will get you back that number for the record sir but I will the, tell the you issue is if everybody gets an outstanding then that's that doesn't mean anything so if, if i will assure you sir that in the senior exec executive cadre at the VA, the number of outstandings has steadily decreased over the last couple of years as a result of the system of accountability that Secretary Sinsecki has brought to the department, and not just for the senior execs, but in other areas. And we'll, we're glad to get that to you for the record, sir. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're back. Thank you. Which means there are a lot of bonuses being given out. Ms. Brownlee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, 
I uh, also wanted to sort of follow up on this accountability issue and benchmarks, um, et cetera. So you, you, you're saying that you have provided them. Um, <clears throat> and I want to know how you are going to report back to us and your process by which you're meeting those benchmarks, um, how, what's your recommendation and the best ways for us, us to hold, to monitor what you are doing over over the course of the next 18 months. I think you said I wasn't here for the part of the testimony, but my understanding was that you would have this complete by 2014, the integrated system, health system. We have a set of near-term goals that we share that the IPO is executing. I haven't reviewed them in detail yet, uh, but I will be doing that very shortly and we will have commitments on what we will deliver and when. I don't think it will change substantially from the current plan. I am concerned about some of the schedule risk and some of the things we're doing. We'll be in close contact with, with the committees and their staffs as we go throughout this process. We know there's a lot of interest in these programs and in their success for very good reasons. And we also know that the history has been a source of some frustration. So we're gonna keep in close contact. We will have specific benchmarks that we have to meet. We'll inform you of how we're doing against them. And, and you'll have those complete by um, I should have some of those with in place within the next few weeks. From my perspective, I'll let, uh, I think some already exist from the perspective of the VA that uh, they're more confident of than I am right now. The, the VA has uh, commitments in place. In fact, uh, the near-term accelerators that we've been speaking about today, uh, there are sites where we're deploying that integrated viewer. It is taking place during the month of uh, July. The end of the month of July, we'll have it at all the polytrauma units, so we will complete that. Uh, by the end of December, we will have uh, built that viewer where today you're seeing the information separate, but as a result of the work on, on data translation, you'll be able to see a blended view that will be by the end of December. Uh, so that is on the joint side. Uh, we are still finalizing the deployment schedule of that joint viewer at different facilities and capabilities in 2014. That is the, the piece uh, uh, Secretary Kendall was referring to. On the VA side, we have a commitment uh, to ensure that we're deploying the, the core capability, which is about 15% of the IEHR uh, that the VA made the decision on back in December uh, by one October next year at two locations, Hampton Roads and San Antonio. So there, there is a set of near term that we are making great progress on, uh, and there are some out year uh, commitments that we've made in terms of uh, deploying systems and making the necessary enhancements. Thank you. I yield back. Ms. Saunders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. I'm glad that this Joint Armed Services Veterans Affairs hearing is becoming an annual exercise. This is our second, and I hope we uh, continue to have it in the coming years. There are a wide number of continuum of care issues which we've been discussing here today. So I think it just shows us how obvious it is and how little sense it makes to treat DOD and the VA as two separate stovepipes when it comes to addressing some of the most critical health challenges our veterans are facing. And I appreciate uh, all the work that you are putting into it. Certainly survivors of military sexual assault are among the most vulnerable members of this population. And I greatly appreciate the efforts over the last several years by both DOD and the VA to improve the treatment of the victims of this crime within the armed services. I was heartened to learn yesterday in a meeting with senior representatives from the VA, including Assistant Secretary Mooney, that the documentary film The Invisible War is now mandatory viewing for senior VA managers. Uh, this is a movie that has really helped to draw very important attention uh, to the great challenge of this issue. Uh, and in, among its many, um, uh, many ways in which it did do so, it also painfully highlighted the multiple bureaucratic hurdles that a survivor of such assaults um, has to endure uh, to prove that their physical and mental health symptoms are connected to, connected to an incident of military sexual trauma within the VA uh, and shows that too often victims are unsuccessful in pursuing their claims for assistance. So to, to address one aspect of this problem, uh, the fiscal year 2012 defense authorization included language that required the Secretary of Defense in consultation with the Secretary of the VA to develop a comprehensive policy for the Department of Defense uh, on going about the retention of and access to evidence and records relating to sexual assaults 
involving members of the armed services because that was one of the issues uh, that uh, we've come to understand. So my office continues to closely monitor implementation of this and other vital measures. Uh, I want to honor the two-minute time limit. I will submit some questions for the record, uh, but just to let you know that this is an issue uh, that this committee uh, takes very seriously, and I look forward to. I heard some of the some some uh, feedback yesterday as to the work you all are doing, and we will continue to monitor it closely. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Leah, for yielding, Dr. Heck. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for taking the time to be here today. My question has to do with the Integrated Disability Evaluation System, which attempts to take what was an almost 540-day process and get it down to about 295 days from profile initiation to either unit reintegration or separation. Can you give me an update on the progress of IDES and the cooperation between both DOD and the VA, specifically Phase 1, the MEB process, and Phase 2, the PEB, PDA process? Secondarily, do you believe that uh, when an integrated electronic health record is finally achieved, that that will help expedite uh, the process even further? And what more, if anything, can Congress do to help the IDES process along? Uh, thank you, Congressman, uh, for that question. Uh, um, obviously, the integrated disability evaluation system has uh, been uh, troublesome, oh, particularly over the early parts of uh, the war. Uh, since uh, we have bro brought a collaborative effort uh, to uh, looking at uh, uh, the process uh, from uh, beginning to end, I think a lot of uh, improvement has been made so that if you look particularly in the uh, Navy and the Air Force, uh, they're meeting standards relative to the MEB and the PEB process. The Army still has some outlier um, uh, sites, and the reason, of course, is they've got the bulk of uh, the wounded warriors and the folks in the IDES system. There still are about 36,000 folks uh, in the IDES system. But uh, we've made a commitment uh, to improving um, the uh, process of that information. So the single disability rating and the information flowing back from the VA to inform the final um, uh, narrative summaries uh, has improved tremendously. And so uh, uh, most of the medical boards are now meeting standards. Uh, uh, and most of the PEB boards are now meeting standards. Um, we have increased, of course, the number of uh, uh, personnel assigned, um, and we continue to refine the information management. So to the last part of your question about uh, electronic uh, transfer of information, uh, it, it is not only about transfer of the uh, health information, which most of the current error um, uh, servicemen and women have electronic records, uh, but it is about getting that loose paper that we talked about, and we've got a solution for that, which will be in place in the near term, uh, uh, basically. So my expectation is that we'll be able to drive down even more the number of days uh, relative to that particular process. There are some things that contribute to the total number uh, on the periphery, which are probably not as important as such as the number of leave days that are accrued and those kinds of things. But I don't know that that impacts sort of the quality of the experience and the fairness of the process. Um, but there have been uh, a significant improvement in the overall uh, system. Dr. Winstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple of questions on the um, health electronic medical records, if you will. And I'm just curious how much provider input is being given as to how the system is set up. Is there an ease for them? And is there anything being done to reduce some of the administrative load to the, to the providers? Uh, so that they can see more patients. And then um, lastly, I just want to clarify, hopefully we are headed towards a goal of, of not just sharing two systems and having access to two systems, but actually having one DOD VA record. And I'll address that to both doctors. Thank you. So thank you so much for that question, because uh, I want to point out a couple of things uh, that in the proposed legislation, I was struck by the fact that as the Congress was requiring us to set up this advisory committee, there was no requirement for clinical input uh, on that advisory board. And so uh, I'm taking you have some experience with uh, uh, electronic health records uh, from the provider uh, point of view. 
Uh, let me assure you that Dr. Petzl and I are, um, represent the functional community, uh, and we have extensive integrated clinical informatics boards made up of clinicians that um, help develop the requirements. So it's a, a functional community driven, even as we know that the system has got to support other administrative processes. But it's, it's not the pyramid turned upside down where the administrative process, uh, which is probably the mistake we made earlier in the Department of Defense, uh, uh, where the administrative process uh, drives the development of the record so that it becomes uh, difficult to use by the provider. So uh, I wholeheartedly accept uh, uh, your challenge and your question. And I think Dr. Petzl and I are meeting that uh, uh, in terms of uh, how we're developing the requirements. Uh, thank you. I would echo uh, Dr. Winthrop. I would echo what uh, Dr. Woodson has said. Um, and I would uh, also point out that uh, the VA record was really developed by a group of clinicians as a clinical management platform. It had nothing to do with the administrative functions. And the tradition within our organization is that the clinicians set the requirements and really drive the process of, uh, of, of developing the record. And the IPO, with its clinical advisory board, has really adopted that principle. The two groups of clinicians from DOD and VA have worked very well together developing the requirements for the various packets of, uh, of, uh, of applications that are going to eventually hang on this record. And I would also point out that it is my sincere desire that we have a single record between these two organizations as well as eventually across the federal government. Uh, sir, if I might just add one, one particular point, I, I'd be very happy to work with uh, any uh, clinicians or members of Congress who want to look at the functionality of what we're rolling out this year uh, to make sure that you understand uh, what we're really delivering, in, delivering on in terms of that uh, integrated interoperability uh, piece. It's usable. That's the key thing. It's usable. So we'd be happy to demonstrate it to you. Thank you. And I'd like to get that website you mentioned earlier. Mr. Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a veteran and a citizen, thank you all for what you do. Um, I appreciate the chairman for holding this again, getting us together, and echo my colleague's uh, statement this is important. Mr. Pommel, two questions to you. I'll ask them both together and get my response. Uh, you have the authority to, uh, to issue interim, partial, or temporary uh, disability benefits. That obviously speeds the process along. It gets important things like folk rehab to our folks right away before these become chronic problems. Uh, I have to tell you, it doesn't appear to be happening in southern Minnesota when I check around the country. My, my question to you is, are VA opposed to interim ratings and compensation uh, that's been determined there's going to be at least 30 percent because I, I don't see it happening. My other question deals with private medical evidence. You use them for, uh, for DBQs, but we're having a problem getting that in to get uh, some of the ratings done. I, I have a piece of legislation along with Mr. Denham to, uh, to try and use that. Let's maximize our resources. Let's have a force multiplier and use these medical evidence, get them in. You already use them for DBQs. Why not further them along? Those are my two questions. Um, the first question, um, um, are we opposed to the, the interim ratings? No, we're not. And I'll have to check and find out what's going on. On the second one, we, uh, we, we do have a problem getting private medical evidence. Um, a, a lot of the, the raters that are out there that are actually doing the rating of the service members, um, when I go around and talk to them, tell me that, uh, you know, sometimes you have to query a doctor's office three, four times trying to get the private medical evidence. So. Anything that we can get that would help us speed up getting that private medical evidence, we're hoping that the DBQs will be a big step in that, where the service member can walk in and say, uh, doctor, could you please fill out this DBQ? It's uh, pretty self-explanatory, easy to fill in the blanks, and they can do it electronically or by hand and get that from the doctor, and that would forego the need for those private medical records. But uh, in the cases where we need them, it, it, it's tough. To We've got folks that want or off from anecdotally there. There seems to be that the thought is that there's a bias against using that outside information, which always sticks in the craw of my folks because it's Mayo Clinic and some of those. Uh, I hope that's not the case. No, it's not the case uh, from, from VBA. We, we not only are we not opposed to the private medical records, we actively seek those privately records and we're required by law to contact those doctors and attempt to get those records. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening this important hearing. I, I join with my colleagues in wishing that we were uh, 
uh, listening also to the Secretaries of Defense and uh, Veterans Affairs, uh, but I'm pleased, of course, that the witnesses are here. I represent a district where there are about 90,000 veterans, one of the largest in the country. I also represent the men and women of two uh, military installations, Fort Huachuca and Davis Monthan Air Force Base. The veterans caseload is the highest of any in our office. I think that's probably true of all of my colleagues. And the frustration that they feel, uh, the veterans who come to us and my staff feel in getting progress is, uh, is never ending. And while I understand and appreciate your efforts to, uh, to develop systems that will take care of this backlog, I think one of the ways that you might understand our frustration is to sit, spend an hour in one of our offices taking calls from veterans um, and listening to their frustration and their concerns. It's very enlightening and, and obviously a very emotional experience. So my question to you is this. What are leaders of DOD and the Veterans Administration doing to set measurable uh, progress uh, uh, metrics and holding people accountable. Leadership is about setting goals, holding people accountable, measuring progress. And I'd like to know concretely from both of the uh, departments, what concrete measurements are you putting in place and how are you holding your staff accountable for meeting those measurements? That's the only way we're going to get this job done. And I appreciate your answers. Thank you. Um, I, uh, Congressman, from the, uh, uh, the, the benefit side, the compensation side and the backlog, um, we now, um, at the behest of uh, Undersecretary Hickey, have some very strong and stringent uh, metrics in place for not only the individual raters, but their coaches, their supervisors, the uh, regional office directors, all, all the way up through the leadership. Um, we, we know it's, um, you, can, you can look at the math, you can see what we have to do to knock out the number of claims that are coming in and the backlog. And we've set standards that people have to do that. Um, we in VBA didn't meet what we were supposed to meet last year. We were, the, the backlog grew um, for a lot of reasons. We uh, pushed our automation program, VBMS. We now have it out, out there. As a result of our, our uh, performance last year, no senior executives in VBA received a performance uh, award at the end of the year because we felt that it was a it was an overall goal of, the, of, of our administration, of the VBA, to uh, uh, make positive progress on the backlog. We didn't get there, so no performance awards were paid out. Um, uh, this year, the, we'll, we'll look at the standards. We do see that some of the regional offices have really turned the corner. The ones that have got, the, um, some are really embracing VBMS and starting to churn out the claims thus two months in a row of of breaking an all-time record, but that's still not enough. We're still not where we need to be. We have a higher standard we need to reach, and we will hold people to that standard. Thank you. And from defense? Thank you, sir, for the question. Um, uh, as we talked about before, we we are the, the uh, providers of information so VA can process the claims. We're not the claims processor, so it's our responsibility to provide that information. So. Um, working with VA, there was about 4% that we owe. We have, uh, and those are for the backlog. So we have two teams on the ground that are hands-on going through these records, calling back and getting, seeing if this information is in DOD and providing that to the disability claims adjusters so they can adjust the claim. We also, according to VA, they said the single most important thing that we can do to assist them was to provide them with the, the certified service treatment records. So to hold people accountable, both myself as the acting undersecretary and the vice ch uh, chairman of the Joint St Chiefs of Staff receive reports weekly to make sure that we are working towards the metric of 100%. We are at the 97 percentile now, and we are working towards the metric of 100% within a 45-day window of when the service member departs DOD. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Scott, then Mr. R Dr. Rowe. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. And I, <clears throat> I do believe you're sincere in uh, trying to, to cure this backlog. My, my questions will be more for uh, Dr. Petzl and Mr. Warren, uh, if, if you will. And we all know, as, as I just said, that the veterans are waiting too long to have their benefits processed and receive the benefits. And uh, in the private sector, um, 
beneficiaries would actually be receiving an interest payment for uh, the time between when the claim uh, should have been adjudicated and when it actually was, and that's something that we may need to look at from our side. I'm glad to hear about the, uh, the VBMS software and the continued progress there that's going in. And my concern comes from the reports and, and the delays, and I know you've addressed this, just the months that may take place before the veterans records are processed into that VBMS system. And I know many of them have to be manually scanned and many of them probably have to be transcribed uh, and that contributes to the, to the delay. But one of the things that I think also contributes to the, to the confusion and the delay is that veterans, because they're unable to track their records, resubmit their records, which means there's more paper uh, coming into to the system and more files. And so uh, what's being done to, to, to speed up that or, or at the least track the records? And, and I think if there was a tracking system so that the veterans could go online and see that all of the paperwork had been received and that their claim was in process and where it was in line and being processed, that may resolve some of that. And if you'd speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, yes, Congressman, I'll answer that question. Uh, you, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, our big problem in VBA is always going to be, um, for the next few years, we're going to receive a million claims a year. Uh, most of those claims are going to come from outside the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense claims that we're, we're going to get um, from service members that are leaving active guard and reserve, um, we'll have the electronic personnel, dental, and medical records, so that we'll be able to do exactly what you say. For all the other veterans that send us in the paper and, and multiple copies of the paper, we're still going to have to take those records, ingest them through some scanning system that we have in place and put them into VBMS. Right now, as I, I, I stated before, we're only at 20% done with that right now. We still have 80% to go, and it's probably going to take us about a year to get the ones that we have in. Meantime, a million new ones are going to come in in the same status. So it's a never-ending uh, problem that's always going to be there. One of the, the, the uh, future things that we have in VBMS is if you go into My eBenefits right now and you file a claim, you can see when your claim is filed, but what you can't see is have we received your records, what's the status for your claim. Future upgrades of VBMS, I'm not, I, I think it's December 6.0, will allow the veteran to see when the claim arrived, what the status of their claim is, and the VBMS software has built into it right now for the scanning. If you in the, if you scan a document in a medical record and then six months later you send us the same medical record, the system will identify there's a duplicate of that record because it's, se it's a semi-intelligent system and will we'll prevent that new record from going in. What, what it doesn't prevent is when it arrives, the clerk that gets it doesn't know that it's already in there, so somebody has to take that record, yeah. get it to the scanning operation, rescan it, and then once it's there, we realize that we already have it. It'll prevent having extra records, but we don't know how to prevent the work in the first place other than to notify the veterans, please go online, My eBenefits, register, look. You'll see that we did get your file. You will be able to actually go online and look at your file. Right now, I can go into My eBenefits. I went in there last week, and I was missing one of my personal files from my time in the Army. And through My eBenefits, I linked into my, my Army electronic record was able to get the personal file downloaded and ship it over to the VA. Still a little complicated, but it, we're getting better and better at it, Congressman. Dr. Rowe and then Mr. Kirkpatrick. Uh, thank the Chairman and thank you all for being here. It's good to see you all again. And uh, just a couple of three quick things. One of the, as Mr. Scott and uh, Barbara both mentioned, um, one of the most common thing that Congressman, probably everybody up here has, are, are backlog VA claims. Why can't they get adjudicated uh, quicker? And I know these 800,000 claims are likely a hodgepodge of uh, World War II, uh, Korea, Vietnam, uh, Desert Storm, and so forth. So I think, I think that's correct. H how many of those are in an electronic format where you could actually look at them that you've scanned them in? H where are they? That's one. And then the second question that I still want to get an answer to that I'm still not sure I do. I know that the DOD has an orphaned uh, electronic health system and they're, they're going to have to replace it out of software and new hardware upgrades. I, I think what everybody's asked, but it's still not clear to me, is that when a, when a young soldier, an 18-year-old soldier, takes the oath, 
and, and goes into the military, will, will that system that the DOD has as an electronic record be able to transfer directly to the VA and speak seamlessly to the VA when this is, when we spent billions of dollars, we just spent a billion and we couldn't do that. Uh, it just didn't happen. So is, is that going to happen? Because it's not clear to me I've heard yes or no on that yet. So that's, those are two questions I have. So maybe I can respond to the last question um, first, and then my VA colleagues can uh, respond to your questions to them. The answer is yes. Uh, and that is why we have got to concentrate on the data interoperability. Okay. Yes, and then when? So uh, again, by the end of uh, 2013 and rolling out in 2014, and again, I'll show you the functionality if, um, uh, if you would like as to what that means. Uh, so, so the answer is yes. Um, it's important to understand that we'll always be evolving system and we have to communicate again with the private sector. Many times this morning we've talked about the loose paper and issues relative to what we need to capture from the private sector. So it's got to be about data standards so that we can transfer information rather than what system someone is on because we'll never get the entire nation to be on the same system right. but we do need to capture that data one last thing mr chairman uh just and i'll yield my time back is one of the things the va is doing i think is very good is the video conferencing for va uh, for veterans who want to appeal we did our first one in the district the other day so that, that a disabled veteran doesn't have to go to nashville and then drive to, to washington dc you can video conference that, and that, that will save tons of money, make it much easier. So I want to commend you on doing that and encourage you to continue to do that. I yield back. Ms. Mr. Kirkpatrick and Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question to the panel has to do with immediate mental health treatment. 22 veterans commit suicide every day. Uh, every time a new patient goes to the VA, they have to go through the enrollment and eligibility process, which includes a physical exam. Oftentimes, this, this physical exam takes two months or more to set up, and this includes patients who need immediate uh, mental health treatment. My VA caseworker uh, is, is contacting hospitals directly to schedule these emergency physicals for these veterans who need immediate treatment. Uh, I know the Department of Defense does a quick evaluation uh, before discharge, but there's no direct handoff of that evaluation to the VA. So my question is, how can the VA and the Department of Defense work together? What kind of system has to be put in place as, as soon as possible to make sure that these veterans get their immediate mental health treatment? Let me, uh, uh, Congressman, Congressman Kirkpatrick, let me just address the, uh, the emergency part of this. If someone has an urgent or emergent medical uh, mental health condition they will be seen immediately they don't have to have a physical they don't have to have anything else they will be seen and evaluated for that mental health condition and um, if it should uh, transpire that they need to be admitted etc they can be admitted the rest of the work in terms of determining eligibility etc will occur um, i would I'd like to talk personally with you about the specific cases. If they're something less than urgent or emergent, then yes, there is a, a step process that one uh, goes through, but it can be done in a pretty expeditious way. Let's follow up because, because I, evidently it's not help, happening, and, and, if, and it may be the criteria that's used for what is an emergency. So we I would be delighted to talk with you okay. about it. Uh, the response for the Department? Defense, please. Uh, yes, uh, I think previously in the testimony, both Dr. Petzl and I talked about um, integrated mental health strategy, warm handoff, case managers that handle um, service members with identified mental health problems that need immediate and follow-up care. So I think over uh, the last couple of years, we've really enhanced uh, greatly identifying individuals who have uh, particular mental health problems that need to be seen right away, making sure that they get to those appointments. Doctor, let me ask with that evaluation that's done right before discharge, is there any way to make a quick handoff to the VA of that information and the results Ab of that? Absolutely. We, we do that. We that's transfer the, that is being done? Yeah, we transfer it, it, those, okay. those, those records. I yield back. Thank you for the courtesy, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kilmer and then Mr. Nugent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My questions for Dr. Petzl and Mr. Pummel. Uh, obviously, admirably, many employers have shown leadership in hiring uh, those who've served. But I want to raise a concern that I've heard over the years from service members reintegrating into civilian life. 
who have reported that their military or veteran status has uh, occasionally been used against them in the pursuit of employment or in the pursuit of housing. Um, with employers or landlords raising uh, concerns raising from fears that someone would potentially get redeployed or uh, in uh, some cases folks raising concerns about things like post-traumatic stress. In my state, I worked with a coalition of veterans groups and a bipartisan group to try to address uh, this and expand non-discrimination protections in our state. I was hoping you could briefly tell us if you're aware of this type of discrimination uh, against veterans and returning service members. Uh, Congressman, I, I, I've heard that kind of stuff anecdotally, but I, but I can't relate a specific incident. Um, I, I, I do know that there was a uh, um, a, 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 a bill being pushed forward about uh, um, anti-discrimination against veterans. And from a VA perspective, um, we are advocates of veterans. Um, we're very supportive of any efforts in that area. We haven't had a chance to study the bill yet. I haven't actually seen it. But because of the subject matter uh, discretion, uh, uh, discrimination, it'd probably be a uh, Office of Personnel Management and Department of Justice would have to uh, be giving the opinions on that, but um, from a VA perspective, we support it. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, Congressman, just make a comment. Um, the VA has developed a, an educational package for employers that we use often at uh, the employee forums that we have uh, around hiring veterans um, that uh, tend to uh, uh, debunk, if you will, the myths about uh, veteran employees around mental health issues as well as the rest of, uh, of the issues that might arise, as you say, um, because of someone's uh, veteran status. We're trying, working very hard to have employees understand that these are excellent employees. They're very well trained, they're disciplined, they're used to working hard, and they're bright, and they can contribute tremendously to uh, a workplace. Thank you. I, I certainly agree with you, and I, I'm hopeful we can have more comprehensive protections. We'll be getting a copy of that bill to you. Uh, Senator Blumenthal and I are working on a bill together, and we'll get it, get that to you. Thank you. Mr. Nugent and Ms. Duckworth. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank this panel for your service to our, our country and what you do for our veterans. And being a father of three veterans currently serving, I do appreciate it. But one of the things I hear, and I have about 100,000 veterans in my district, is that the, the vernacular between doctors and claim processors sometimes does not match up, which causes them issues when it goes to VBA because they're looking for certain keywords as they're scanning through it because there's so much there, and, and I understand that. So my question to you is, what are we doing to try to, to marry up uh, or delineate you know, the vernacular so it doesn't cause our veterans the problem because we know what the doctor's intent is, they go to the VA, but they haven't filled out the form with the proper wording and then it gets kicked. What, if anything, are we doing to address that? Thank you, Congressman Nugent. And uh, you have articulated an issue which, in the most part, is in the past. The uh, development of the disability questionnaires, the, we call them DBQs, um, that are to be filled out by the VA doctor or the private doctor basically answer all the questions. So there is no ambiguity in terms of the language. And a rater can take that DBQ and can do the rating basically from the DBQ because it forces the clinician to answer the questions in a fashion that will be understood by, by the rater. I'd ask Mr. Pummel if he has any other comment about that. Uh, the, the, uh, I would agree with Dr. Petzl. Well, the, the, let me ask you this question. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but we have a short time. Uh, is that currently being done, particularly, uh, you know, with docs at the VA, believe it or not, that's part of the problem. We're hearing that specifically today still. Um, the, yes, it is. And I, uh, the other thing that I wanted to add is that we have in the main a separate group of physicians that do and providers that do pension and compensation exam that are trained in the vocabulary, if you will, of claims and adjudication. I can't say that there isn't an occasional issue or problem, but in the main, these two systems, I think, work very well together. If you have a specific instance, I would love to talk with you about it and see if we can find out what happened. Thank you so very much. I yield back. 
Ms. Duckworth and Mr. Thank Gibson. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I first want to um, just note that it's very clear that this panel is very much dedicated to our military men and women and to our veterans. Uh, many of you have your own military service, um, uh, decades of military service, as well as um, your decades in civilian service. Um, I, I just have to uh, note that uh, we have in our midst uh, General Wright, who um, is the first female helicopter pilot in the National Guard, and um, women in aviation stand on your shoulders. Um, so thank you for that. Mr. Warren, um, you know, I think it's widely known that um, VA's uh, Chief Information Officer's uh, Office has had many successes in terms of the delivery of PMAS and other cost-saving measures and, and, and new systems. Um, I want to make sure that we as members of Congress are doing the right thing in terms of how we work with you, um, uh, both Mr. Warren and Mr. Kendall, in developing the electronic integra integrated electronic um, uh, record system. Um, I'd like Mr. Warren to answer first, and then um, if we have time, Mr. Kendall, um, what can we do to help with this process as members of Congress? Are there, you mentioned um, specifically, Mr. Warren, uh, you know, there's a lot of reports that you have to do that take up a lot of time, but are there other things, restrictions on decisions you're making, budget authority? Are there um, different colors of money, developmental money versus acquisition money? What is there that Congress can do to help you um, move forward with this effort? Thank you for that question and, and, and the offer. Uh, I would say that uh, holding, continuing to hold us accountable for progress is key. And, and I think a lot of the effort and a lot of the overcoming of institutional barriers has been a result of the interest and the desire to make sure we do not only what's right for our service member, for our veteran. So thank you for that. And I believe that is important. Uh, the, the challenge we are, are facing today is there is language that constrains where we can uh, execute dollars. It, it is pretty acute on the VA side. We, we've made a commitment to make uh, deliveries by the end of December and by 1 October next year. Uh, th those are at risk uh, because of some of the constraints on us with respect to execution. There's an ask for plans. Those are in process to be delivered up to the appropriate committee staff for their review. Uh, and any help that we could get and making sure those get cleared so we can continue to make that critical progress would be greatly appreciated, ma'am. Can you provide that information to my office in writing at a later time? Right, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Kendall, just. Yeah, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, what I would ask fundamentally is you not over constrain us. So I'm very concerned, as I mentioned in my opening statement, about some of the language and, and uh, various bills right now. But essentially, we have to um, take some steps to get this program on track, these programs on track, that if we're overly constrained, it will be very, very difficult for us. I need a little bit of time to sort a few things out. I've just recently been asked to take over this by the Secretary. Um, for example, tying us to a strategic plan that was written last fall, which is very much overcome by events now, is not, not particularly helpful, I'm afraid. Uh, it was only submitted to Congress relatively recently. But that plan does not really reflect some very fundamental changes that have been made since it was initially written. So things like that that would that that kind of tie our hands. There are also a lot of reporting requirements on. We, we have no problem with keeping the committees informed. We're happy to do that. Uh, the withholds that are in some of the language, I think, also are becoming increasingly problematic for us, and particularly right now for VA. That's a concern we have that's that's somewhat imminent. So I, we're very happy to work with the committees. We're very happy to work with the members and their staffs. Uh, and to be very transparent about what we're doing. But we ask that in return you be uh, relieve some of the constraints that you have in mind right now and allow us to take the best path forward and give us the opportunity to explain that to you. Thank you. You back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kendall, I appreciate your comments and the fact that you, you just came on board, but there were people before you, there was time before you, and there were billions of dollars spent before you. Mr. Gibson and Mr. Johnson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate very much your leadership. And I, f I found this uh, hearing uh, very helpful this morning. Thank you to the panelists for your leadership and your commitment. Um, the single integrated uh, healthcare record, something that we're all endeavoring towards. Uh, I'm the author of a bipartisan bicameral bill uh, to hold us uh, towards that end, uh, towards Mr. Warren's comment um, just moments ago. Um, and, I, you know, my question may have been answered, uh, but uh, I want to just offer it again uh, to see if um, there might be further uh, clarification. Uh, it has to do with uh, Mr. Kendall's opening remarks where he alluded to onerous language, and I just heard uh, uh, a listing. And I also heard Mr. Woodson uh, earlier. He mentioned that would have been helpful if the language included clinical input. I appreciate those remarks. And so I guess I'll ask Mr. Kendall, is there anything else that you want to highlight 
when you were talking about onerous language because we're trying to strike a balance here between you know not getting in the way of somebody trying to get to where we all think we need to go and at the same time what mr warren said that we've got to hold everyone accountable because the american people are expecting it and of course they should um so uh mr kennel thank you congressman it's a good question I'd, I'd like to take it for the record in order to give you a more detailed answer um we've been reviewing the language I'm a lawyer. I respect lawyers more than most people, perhaps. I'd like to have our lawyers have a chance to take a look at it, because there's some language in there that isn't quite clear to us what the intent is or what it really does to us. So we, I would, I'd like to give you a response for the record that just kind of lays out specifically what it is that we might have a problem with, if that's all right with you. Well, I, I do appreciate it, and of course, that would be fine. Uh, I just want you to understand that part of the reason why um, we're concerned is because we think we're all moving towards that same objective and then we get these comments that well we're it, it appeared to us like we're taking a step back now we've gotten some further context about that but what we really want to do is just make sure we all get up on the objective uh, because we know we need to get there so thank you i look forward to receiving that for the record and with that i yield back mr chairman mr johnson then mr whitman thank you mr chairman and thank you all for your service to the nation uh mr Petzl and uh, Pummel, I'd like to ask, um, are you aware with the, of the situation in Atlanta where three mental health patients uh, were um, uh, ended up uh, dead uh, and uh, poor record keeping and uh, poor management has been cited as uh, one of the reasons for that? Yes, sir, I am aware. And um, are you aware of the allegation, and it may be a fact, that a former top administrator at the Atlanta VA Medical Center received uh, performance bonuses over a four-year span as internal audits revealed lengthy wait times for uh, mental health care and mismanagement that led to the deaths? I am not specifically aware of the track record or the award <coughs> record for senior managers there, but I certainly can find out. Mm -hmm. How about you, Mr. Uh, Pommel? Um, no, Congressman. I, I wouldn't be involved in the Veterans Health Administration. I work over at the Veterans Benefits Administration. Okay. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Petzl, do, do top administrators at the VA still receive uh, bonuses? Uh, Congressman Johnson, yes. Uh, some of the uh, top administrators in, uh, in the in VHA, which is what I can speak for, do receive bonuses, been dramatically reduced. And we call them awards, not bonuses. They've been dramatically reduced by uh, almost, I believe, 50% over the last three years. But yes, there are some people who do receive awards and those awards would be based on what on their performance they have all senior executives have a performance contract and the awards have to be based upon the performance in relationship to their performance contract and who or what entity determines who gets the uh, awards well the recommendation for an award sir is made by the supervisor of the individual, and that then works its way up through the administration. It would pass, in the case of the Veterans Health Administration, through me up to uh, the department level, and eventually all the awards are signed off on at the department level. I see. And um, so approximately how many awards have been granted for the uh, um, 2013 fiscal year? I would have to take that for the record, Congressman, but uh, the awards I think that we're talking about would be uh, administered after the end of the fiscal year. They're based upon the performance during this fiscal year, which would be 2013. So technically there would be no awards that have been uh, administered yet. What about 2012? I would have to take that back for the record, sir. I do not have that on my mind. All right, now yield back. Thank you. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Panelists, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to ask if you would to just limit your uh, responses to yes or no so I can get, get through these questions. I'll begin with Secretary Pummel. Uh, with appropriate privacy release consent, are you willing to work with 
pro bono law schools like the College of William and Mary's Veterans Law Clinic and let them inside the benefit claims process? Yes. Secretary Warren, is a recently discharged combat wounded soldier flagged in the system in a way that their claim is streamlined electronically for immediate review and processing? Sir, I, I can't answer that question, but I will get it for the record, sir. Okay, thank you. Secretary Warren, again, uh, you know, you heard from Mr. Runyon. With today's technology, we can pull records faster than we can in the past. The VA's internal procedure is to wait 60 days after requesting a record and then an additional 30 days to follow up. 90 days of waiting. This is your procedure. Yes or no? Can you change it and reduce the time? I, I believe uh, testimony will show that for... Uh, individuals on active duty that are going through the transition, we have changed that. Okay. Uh, but because of the duty to assist requirements, and, and Mr. Pummel can answer that better than I can in terms of what the, the legal and legislative requirements are with respect to that. But glad to get you a more detailed answer for the record. Okay. I'd, li I'd like like a, just a just a straightforward yes or no. Seems seems to be pretty pretty significant. Can can you can you, can you not reduce reduce the time? We have yes. Okay. Thank you. Secretary Woodson, uh, you're discharging service members who you know have serious injuries, amputees, suicidal PTSD patients. Yes or no, do you communicate with the VA to prioritize these veterans and ensure they have the proper paperwork transitioning to the VA? Yes. Also, can a veteran with no recorded, and I'll ask this of the, of the VA panel members, can a veteran with no recorded medical history documenting a service-connected disability claim something as service-connected in a VA claim years, even decades after the fact for an injury that very well could be connected with aging? I, I, Congressman, I can't answer that with a yes or no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it, uh, you could have something in your personnel record or your dental record or a, a buddy statement uh, or in the uh, case of military sexual trauma, uh, change in performance that would allow you to, to make a claim later on in your life. But for most cases, unless you have something in your medical record that is, um, substantiates a disease, injury, or illness that occurred during an active duty or a period of active duty for the Guard and Reserve, you would not be able to file a claim. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. and. Especially appreciate the update on the uh, the move to complete the project of transitioning over to electronic medical records, and uh, hopefully once and for all, uh, significantly reducing or eliminating the uh, the backlog that uh, that our veterans are facing. It's one of the number one complaints and and problems that uh, that I hear from among uh, veterans in my district. So I I do thank you for your work on that, and I hope that uh, the project is completed as expeditiously as possible. Um, the, obviously, the issues that are under discussion today are, are of course, critical importance uh, and uh, interest to all of us, and we certainly appreciate our witnesses sharing their expertise with us today. I want to focus on uh, uh, the, the path uh, through the DOD and VA system for veterans suffering from neurological traumas such as TBI and spinal cord injury, and I wanted to ask if you can describe for us how their treatment and benefit trajectory uh, varies from the baseline and what supplemental assistance is available other than normal benefits for those no longer able to move around comfortably in their in their homes. Um, uh, and uh, let me say that uh, in response to unmet needs that veterans organizations throughout uh, that have brought to my attention, um, I've introduced uh, what's called the Veterans Home Buyer Accessibility Act last Congress to aid uh, our injured service members, modify their homes to uh, ensure that they're accessible. And I certainly plan to introduce it again in this Congress. Has there been an examination of benefit shortfalls specific to neurological traumas, particularly with regard uh, to adaptive modifications to homes? So if you could take both of those questions. Uh, Congressman, I can, I can uh, begin. The uh, VA does have an adaptive uh, home modification program, um, substantial thousands, I think even tens of thousands of dollars can be spent on modifying a veteran's home uh, f for mobility with, uh, you know, with the uh, within that home. I am not aware of the fact that there are restrictions or shortfalls in uh, the benefit, and I would certainly like to work with you directly to find out exactly what those shortfalls are. We're we're not aware of them, and I would ask Mr. Pummel 
if he has any other uh, comments, because VBA does administer some of those programs. Uh, no, Congressman. I, I, I'm not aware either, but what I will do is um, I'll get with our veteran service organizations, our partners out there. There are eyes and ears in America. Provide us good information on veterans and, and see what they have to say and what they can provide back to us. And, and, and just like to add, too, that, you know, as we're making progress on, on the, the backlog because of the assistance we're getting from DOD, uh, it's it's trifold. It's it's VB, it's VA, it's DOD, and it's the veteran service organizations helping us get DVQs, fully developed claims, talking to veterans, doing the things that we need to do. So it, it they, they help us a lot, and I'll see what they can provide me. That would be very helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Langevin. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for being with us for a little over two hours. We certainly appreciate that. I thank all the members uh, that were here today to ask some very pertinent questions. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent that all members would have five legislative days with which to revise and extend uh, their remarks and add any extraneous material uh, subject to the uh, hearing topic today. And without objection, so ordered. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.